Okay, welcome back after this um, short break. Next up, we have Andrea Nibiagio um, telling us about um, subsystem locality. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you, organizers, for inviting me. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, the relationship between two notions of locality. And I think this is fitting because it's a, it's a relativistic quantum information conference, right? And one, one, uh, look, one notion of locality is the relativistic notion of locality, which is related to the fact that there is a finite speed of light. Um, and information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. And uh, this is a space-time notion. It's a, no, it's a geometrical notion. So we have uh, space-time is, you know, we have different regions of space-time, and we can characterize whether information can flow from one to the other using this uh, causal structure that comes from it. And then there's a related notion of locality, which is uh, one, the one often used in quantum information theory and quantum foundations, which for the purposes of this talk I will call subsystem locality. And it's got to do with how information travels through systems. So whereas on the space-time case, um, yeah, as I said, it's connected to space-time regions. Over here, we are, the, the notion is anchored on the notion of subsystems. Uh, this is, uh, for example, a, you know, a two-local, I would say, like a two-local circuit where every gate only acts on two systems at a time. This also like, has a way of how information propagates in a system. And often, like, they strike as similar things, but they're not the same, right? For example, in quantum field theory, a field is a very delocalized thing, but it's one single system. So a local gate on the field doesn't have to be like, localized in space necessarily. Uh, where, a place where the relationship, or the difference between those two things is relevant is uh, on some theorems about low energy quantum gravity that uh, Marius and Thomas already mentioned. So there are these theorems, these um, you know, generic arguments for why if we detect that gravity was able to create entanglement between two masses, then the theorem say, well, gravity cannot be both classical and local. And this was the argument in the original papers that proposed these experiments. One was based on quantum mechanics and the OCC argument, local operations and classical communications can create entanglement. This is on a more general, like theory independent, uh, meta, meta theoretic framework of constructor theory. And then there is a the paper by Thomas and collaborators uh, in GPT formalism. And while studying this subject, it became quite clear that what this local means has got nothing to do, or at least is not directly related to relativistic locality. But it's really the fact that, oh, that the evolution breaks down in a certain form that is local with respect to the subsystems. So here, A and B are the two masses that are getting entangled. G is some system. And the evolution in time can be broken up in gates that act only on A and the mediator, and G and, B and the mediator and B. And this is what locality means in this context. Um, classicality is some condition on the existence of this system here. And so, so the relation is not trivial. And so it's not clear if these theorems, for example, apply directly. So my question was, to what extent subsystem locality is an aspect of nature? Like, can we expect it from other things? Because after all, it seems to work most of the time. So when I do something to a chair, it seems I do it only to that chair, right? And uh, often, the fact that the world is made of subsystems and you can op operate on some systems, only certain ones at a certain time, it's assumed as a, as a framework and it's often motivated by relativistic notions that things that are far apart should not affect each other. So the question basically, the broad question is, does subsystem locality hold in quantum field theory? Because these are, in a sense, these are our most fundamental theories of the world, uh, the standard models and general relativity, you say. And um, yes, does a field mediate interactions in the sense of quantum information, in that sense? And uh, yeah, in what, in, what, in what regimes does it hold? And uh, to what extent is actually an exact property of nature? So here I'll talk to you about two ways to think about this that actually don't lead very far. And then one simple example that we figured out with Marius and Chaslav and the collaborators. And then I just close with some open questions. So let's say that we have three systems, A, B, and C, and each they have their own, um, their own Hamiltonian. And then A and C are coupled, and B and C are coupled together. And there is no direct coupling between B and C. Um, does this mean that the evolution is subsystem local? Is, does, does the system C mediate the interaction? Well, let's clump the, the operators such that only some operators, like it doesn't matter really where you put the single system operators. We just look at it like this. And the evolution in time is given by this formula, of course. And this is not equal to a subsystem local operation. It's not equal to a product 
of a gate that acts only on A and C and a gate that acts only on B and C. Because the, the two, these two Hamiltonians will not commute in general. It is true that we can write it at arbitrarily good approximation as a product of, of a two systems gate. Right? So it will hold that any degree of approximation, you can really approximate this evolution by a product of subsystem local gates. And uh, maybe this is enough for the purposes that we need. We'll come back that, to that later. Um, but there is no input from relativity here. This is just a true formula for any two operators. So I don't think it's a very insightful approach. Then, is a, then here we have a counterexample. So let's consider quantum electrodynamics in the Coulomb gauge. Here we have two, two systems, two particles, two charge systems. This is the kinetic term of the radiation. Over here, there is the coupling of the systems with the radiation. And as you see, the two systems are not coupled together here. They're only coupled through the radiation. But then we have the Coulomb term, because we're in the Coulomb gauge. That is a direct interaction between the two particles, at least in this picture, right? And if we go to a regime where the particles are basically at rest and there is no radiation, this Hamiltonian is very well approximated by just the Coulombian term. And this means that no matter how far these two particles are, when you evolve in time, the gate that evolves them in time is a gate that couples them directly. So this is an example in which a theory that is relativistically invariant, uh, this causality in principle should be not possible to send information faster than light, does not satisfy that notion of locality from quantum information theory. So when does it do it? Well, we've managed to find a regime in which actually this works. And this is with a, is this a note that is on the archive. And it's a specific setting. And uh, it is two particles that are coupled to a massive scalar field in a specific regime that I will explain in a second. And basically, if you zone out for the next 10 minutes, this is what's going to happen. The evolution is subsystem local, but only up to some phases in the superpositions. And thanks to relativistic locality, in particular, thanks to the fact that the commutators of fields at space-like separated regions vanish. Thanks to this property, the phases are eliminated, they vanish, and we have relativistic locality in this regime. The regime of approximation is only, uh, it says three, but it's only two, two key assumptions, I would say. Um, first is that the two systems have to be localized, the two part, the systems that are getting entangled, they have to be localized in separate regions of space-time. The, the wave functions should not overlap. And this is already an approximation because in general, the tails of a wave function are gonna be extended all over space, so you have to either force the particles to be localized or just neglect the, the tails. And um, the second one, we use it in the computation, but I, I think it shouldn't be necessary, but I didn't manage to find a way to make it work without this assumption that the, not only are the wave functions restricted to a certain region, but they actually are a superposition of semi-classical states, like very localized, coherent states that don't get further entangled with the field. And this is kind of the picture. Here we have one system in a superposition of different trajectories that are controlled by some quantum qubit, or qubit. And over here, you have the other system. The, the trajectories are far apart from each other. They're very peaked. They're like, they're like Zurich's pointer states. They don't get entangled. Like conditional on one of the branches, they don't get further entangled with the field. It's pretty late, but I, I will go through the, to a bit of the mathematics of it. Um, here is how it works. So this is the Hamiltonian for the system. You have the, we have some driven Hamiltonians for the two particles, A and B. It looks something like this, where there's a, there's a qubit, and conditional on the qubit, we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And this allows to model what you do in the lab, say, like, uh, you know, sending the particle in two different directions, or, I don't know, whatever you want. But this idea of driving the, um, the particles given some qubit. Then we have the kinetic term for the field. This is just a standard thing that you see in old textbooks. And then we have a coupling, which is also standard coupling between the within the particles and the field. So it's local in space, and it's local in the sense that A only interacts with the field, and B interacts with the field, but A and B don't interact together. So this is the setup. And then we take a couple of approximations, which are the ones that I explained before. One is that there is no back reaction from the qubits. Sorry, so there's no back reaction from the particles and the field on the qubits, and there is no back reaction 
from the field, sorry, from the field on the matter. So this means like if you, you know, if you formalize these assumptions, what you get is basically that the state of the whole system is a superposition of a bunch of states that are controlled by the qubits. And in each of these branches that are given by the qubits, we have the matter, the two, the two, the two particles are in some localized states, and the field depends on these particle states too. But in each branch, the, the field and the matter are not further entangled. And yeah, the Hamiltonian, we have, a, we have an evolution for the particles. These are just the driven Hamiltonian, as I, as I anticipated earlier, and also an evolution for the field, um, which is now it's written like this as a Schrodinger equation just for the field. These operators are acting only on the field, and they're given by, so this H Rs is the expectation value of that interaction Hamiltonian, conditional on the states of the particles being like this. And we can write the evolution of the full system in this form. And um, let's look at this. This is not subsystem local, um, because there's a sum here. But if this, final, this, I mean, this unit evolution of the field would factorize in such a way, then you can shuffle the things around and you can write it in a subsystem local form. And so the next part after those approximations is to check whether this property actually holds. So this is the picture we had in mind. We have the particles in these superpositions, this evolution, and for each branch, we have this evolution for the field. And uh, because the states are orthogonal, we can just look at one branch and the evolution for the field in that branch is given by the Hamiltonian. And this is nothing else than a quantum field sourced by a classical source. So then you open a quantum field theory textbooks and you look at this, and uh, while well, you'd have to do some manipulations, and you can actually find an exact solution for this problem, for this, uh, for this system. And it's given by this, there is a free evolution for the field, there is a displacement operator that basically writes information about the trajectories of the particles into the field, and then there is some phase, some term, that normally in textbooks, this is thrown away. They don't care about this. But here we care about it because we, the phases are exactly what shows up in a superposition. So we look at this. We use the algebra for the displacement operator to break it up. And actually, we get to this, which is really close to what we wanted. But we have these phases that are messing up. The, the evolution. So if this phase was not here, this would have exactly the form we want. We could make these sums, we could just make these sums separately, and we would have a system that acts, uh, an evolution that acts only on A and the field, and an evolution that acts only on B and the field, but we don't. So let's look at these phases. They look like this, they don't look great, but uh, if you just look at them for a second, you realize that they are something like space time integral of two classical functions and the commutator of the field. This is the interaction picture field, which is the free evolution of the field. And remember, uh, remember what I said, we have microcausality, right? So these things vanishes when they're space-like. And we're basically there now, because if you look at this picture and you imagine these particles are, they're flying over here, if the time interval is short enough, um, this is the charge density of particle A, this is the charge density of particle B, so this part will only have support on the trajectories. But then if x and x, and x prime are space-like in the whole integral, then that integral vanishes, right? So in other words, if the support of these two functions is space-like during this time interval, then the, then the phase vanishes. This is in one branch, but if we have two branches, if we have all of the branches, then as long as this time interval is such that all branches are space-like separated from all the other, sorry, all trajectories are separated from all the other trajectories in all branches, then, the, then all of these phases vanish, and we get the factorization we wanted, and that's a, exactly the situation in which relativistic locality implies subsystem locality in this form. If the time interval is too long, and this is not true, you just break down the time interval, as Mario said, you just break it down in a number of evolutions, and then inside these things, it will break up, and so you will have a, a series of such evolutions. And actually, this is a physical interpretation. There's a free evolution of the field. Then you write onto the field the effect of particle A 
and then you write onto the field the effect of particle B. And as long as the affected area doesn't overlap, sorry, doesn't overlap with the other source, it breaks down. Perfect. So in summary, but perfect because I'm basically closing. Um, as I said, there are different notions, they are related. We found a model in which the relation seems to be one way, it works like that, uh, that you can find a regime in which, in which a subsystem locality holds. But it doesn't hold always. So we saw it with the example of the Coulomb interaction. Uh, also, if the, just the particles are sitting on top of each other, the information will travel too fast. You won't be able to split the evolution that way. And I think this, like, this relationship that's not completely straightforward is an interesting question for this intersectional area of physics. Uh, for obvious reasons, because one is really native to relativistic studies and special relativity, and the other one is related to quantum information. So I think it's an interesting thing to study. Uh, the next steps would be exactly to see whether, whether and how much these results can be generalized. I'm working on, obviously, to moving to massless gauge fields. Um, I think I need to learn algebraic quantum field theory to make it work. Fortunately, we have uh, experts of quantum field theory coming in the group. And, uh, but the, the big question I'm asking you is, so if, if this does not hold, say that uh, the standard model actually does not allow subsystem locality to be working exactly, does this impact the work that is being done in quantum foundations? Like, can we work with like, an epsilonized version of, um, of subsystems or something like that? And um, with that, I thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you mentioned the difference that, uh, between the scalar field and the electromagnetic interaction. Yeah. Uh, uh, that then there's that Coulomb part that yeah. uh, spoils what you call the, the system locality. Yeah. And well, for the scalar field, it's uh, usually simpler to, to visualize uh, when the things are uh, local and things like that because you don't have uh, gauge symmetries. Right. And, uh, and for the electromagnetic field, you do separate those. Uh, what you call dynamical degrees of freedom of the field, and then the other, the, uh, basically, is the Coulomb field, sourced by the particles. Uh, but in that case, uh, states and things like that, they, they actually turn out to be gauge dependent, right? The, you yeah. have uh, gauge dependence on phases and yeah. everything. I wouldn't think that in the electromagnetic case, you would be able to generate, I don't know, observables that are linked non-locally. And, and, uh, so, uh, I think my question or my comment is uh, a little bit in the sense that uh, even in that case that you do have gauge freedom and, and you find that thing that at least in the state level uh, seems to violate this, this notion of locality, uh, if you think in terms of uh, observables, uh, don't you recover that locality uh, for that case, for, for the Coulomb interaction, for example? Yeah, so um, I think what you're asking is really, it's a question I've been asking myself too, is should we move, instead of looking at syst like states and state spaces, should we just look at how the observables relate to each other? Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, I, th I think the answer should be yes, but I don't know, actually, so we can talk about it more later. Okay. Yeah. And also, sorry, one, one more thing. I, I, like in the Coulomb gauge, maybe that doesn't work, but I was thinking maybe if you move to a covariant gauge, where you have you know, the transverse and the, sorry, the, you have the longitudinal and scalar, scalar parts, mm -hmm. maybe there you get the subsystem locality because you reshuffle the, you reshuffle the Hilbert spaces in such a way that it should work. But I, don't, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, and then I guess there should be some care about what are gauge dependent quantities and what are yeah, yeah, of course. should be gauge yeah, yeah. independent. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, also observable, observables should be gauge independent anyway, yeah. Regions 
Right. I think if you you can just do it n regions, n particles, as long as every particle is space like from every other particle while the thing is happening, it's gonna be fine. As long as that point. So if there's any weird uh, overlap of the light cones and I think as, as yeah, you have to make the time short enough so that all the light cones are space like separated, yeah, all the regions. But then you should just follow through. Yeah. All right, thank you. Like that? Yes, thank you. And then do I hold this? And uh, this? You have to point it up a lot. Um, like this? Press the arrow. So? Load arrows. This one? This one? Okay, so hi everyone. Um, First, I would like to thank uh, the people from the RQI community who had the idea for this workshop, and of course the local organizers who put all this together, and uh, for inviting me to talk here. Um, I'm very happy for this opportunity because I just finished my uh, PhD on topics in RQI, and I'm very happy to uh, be here for a postdoc. So this is a nice opportunity of roughly summarizing what I've been uh, doing and um, trying to put it in like the overall uh, context of uh, what's going on in the topic of QFT measurements recently. So this is not going to be a very technical talk, so hopefully it's easy to follow at this time of the day. Uh, I will talk about aspects of QFT measurements and in particular aspects that have to do with uh, the role of scattering, um, considerations of causality, uh, how uh, we can use detector models um, to understand causality and so on. Uh, okay, so talking about measurements in QFT, first two basic observations. First, that the standard measurement axioms, um, the axioms that give us the probabilistic predictions of quantum theory, such as Born rule and the state update rule, uh, are not part of uh, quantum field theory and not even its axiomatic uh, formulation. And in fact, as uh, Sorkin pointed out in this 1993 uh, paper that has become uh, very popular recently, um, the naive extension of these um, axioms into quantum field theory uh, can lead to frictions with relativistic causality, which is what he called impossible uh, measurements. But then, of course, measurement is possible in quantum field theory in a different sense. So in the standard formulation of QFT, standard predictions that are very well experimentally verified and so on, standard predictions of QFT take the form of asymptotic scattering uh, amplitudes. So this might give the impression, at least when we first learned QFT, that QFT is a theory about scattering. But is this a case? Is, is QFT a theory about uh, scattering? As we will... Um, as I will argue, um, partially yes and partially no. So no because modeling local measurements in quantum field theory, local rather than asymptotic, I mean, is possible within QFT and there has been a lot of progress uh, recently about this. And this is uh, what we, we, we try to summarize in this uh, review paper with uh, Doreen Fraser. Um, and Partially yes, also because this requires local generalizations of scattering theory, basically. So talking about um, scattering and how QFT became a theory about uh, uh, scattering and so on, the historical perspe perspective can be very, very uh, interesting. There is this very interesting uh, work by Alex Bloom, um, where he describes this uh, shift from instantaneous or stationary states, which is typ typically what we calculate in quantum mechanics, uh, to asymptotic scattering amplitudes um, in QFT. So this is a shift, he calls it a paradigm shift, that took like several decades. Um, 
what we did in this um, uh, short note, again with uh, Doreen Fraser, a, a philosopher of quantum field theory at the University of Waterloo, is that we basically revisited some historical episodes um, that ha were, were happening in parallel to this shift while quantum field theory was being, getting established as a scattering theory, so to say. But in parallel, there were uh, very interesting episodes on modeling local measurements in QFT. Uh, we revisit this episode starting from the early history of quantum field theory in the 1930s. The 1930s is uh, an interesting uh, starting point because uh, roughly it marks both the beginning of quantum field theory, quantum field theory was still in the making, and the beginning of quantum measurement theory, what we call today quantum measurement theory, which is due to um, the work by von Neumann in the early 1930s, the axiomatization of quantum mechanics and so on. So yeah, QFT and uh, quantum measurement theory were starting uh, together in the 1930s. They were not overlapping um, so much. Um, so it's interesting to uh, revisit these episodes uh, um, it also because uh, on the way um, there, there are some, um, um, some considerations that, that led to the tradition of the algebraic, um, um, the algebraic tradition to quantum field theory. But anyway, this would be a separate um, uh, talk. So for now, I'm, ju I'm just going to say that from today's perspective, one moral that someone can draw is that in the end, modeling local measurements within quantum field theory did not necessarily require going back to instantaneous states or anything like that, basically undoing this, but rather introducing local generalizations of uh, scattering theory. Examples of that are both the um, detector model approach in quantum field theory, also in Kerr-Swiss times, and also the fusor inverse framework in the context of algebraic quantum field theory. I call it local generalization scattering theory, but of course how local these generalizations are crucially depends on how the dynamics is modeled, depends on the locality properties of the dynamics over the interaction region. Something interacts with the field over here, for example, and uh, then the next region is, uh, doesn't have to be asymptotically far in the future, but it just has to be in this generalized out region, which is everything but the causal past. Um, and then, yes, the dynamics and the, how the dynamics is model becomes uh, important. So um, the role of dynamics is, uh, is something that uh, can be appreciated when, when one is considering particular models for detector uh, field interactions. In particular, in our work, we considered under the V-type detector models. And then the role that the dynamics plays in uh, what operations are allowed, what operations are possible, and what operations lead to friction with relativistic causality uh, becomes important and has interesting interpretational consequences about the form that the measurement problem takes in QFT. Uh, but there's no time to really uh, go into this. I just put a very interesting reference about this over here by Emily Adlam. Um, and then more, like in a, more of like a pragmatic spirit, um, what we quantified basically in this work with Jose de Ramon and Eduardo Martin Martinez, what we uh, analyzed was that basically how much of a causality violation you get in some setups uh, really depends on how local the dynamics is. For example, in very um, uh, nice local frameworks like the FV framework in which you don't get this effect of impossible measurements, you don't take this type of causality violation. It's basically thanks to a nice causality, a nice dynamical um, property that's called the local time slice property. What we're asking basically is that what if you don't have all these nice locality um, assumptions? And, and in these setups, an advantage of the detector model approach is that you can actually quantify these violations. Um, for concrete uh, models that are typically used in quantum optics and quantum information in general by means of the scales, uh, the physical scales that come into the problem, like coupling strength and uh, energy scales and so on. So I will not uh, go through the details of how we um, analyze it, but just one important property of the dynamics that we proved for some cases is the causal factorization of the um, uh, joint scattering map. When you have two detector field interactions like this, they're causally orderable because this one doesn't intersect the causal path of this one. 
Uh, this uh, is the unitary that basically corresponds to both interactions, and in general, this doesn't split, right? And, um, um, in some cases, it follows from, from a micro-causality, similar to the spirit of what we were hearing before, in a way, that for causally orderable compactly supported interactions, this map actually factorizes. And if the two regions are in space-like separation, which here they are not exactly, uh, the, the maps also commute. This guarantees uh, that uh, no faster than light signaling and no retrocausation in bi bipartite scenarios like this. But if we move to more complicated scenarios with more regions, like the ones that are considered in the um, Sorkin type uh, problem, then microcausality alone, which leads to causal factorization, is not enough for blocking this, uh, this causality violation. So that has to do with this region over here being sensitive to what's going on over there through this intermediate region that partially invades the forward light cone of this one and partially invades the past light cone of that one. So it's basically because it's not enough that the expectation values are unaffected in space like separation, but that a local kick that someone can impose locally on the, over this region cannot get propagated to B through A. Uh, the, this, as we formulated it in this paper, is a dynamical requirement that basically fails uh, due to the fact that the uh, current, um, well, I showed it previously, but I didn't explain it. So you have the, like a um, detector current that's coupled to the field here. If this detector current uh, is not microcausal due to the non relativistic dynamics, then you get this sort of like superluminal dynamical effect. Um, so nevertheless, what we could do is that for weakly coupled detectors, this type of causality violation uh, is subletting order in perturbation theory. And you can give arguments uh, in terms of the regime of validity of the model uh, on a case by case uh, fashion. OK, um, just a quick uh, recap up to here. And then I'm just going to make uh, one more point and I'm done. OK, so what I try to argue, argue is that one can model measurements over finite space and regions, in this sense, local measurements, using QFT. And this uh, uh, goes through the local generalizations of scattering uh, processes that one can describe by supplementing QFT with suitable models or with suitable uh, frameworks. And this is also a way to make sense of um, ad hoc uh, causality conditions that have been introduced in this nice work over here. And I, by ad hoc, I mean that these causality conditions are uh, model independent. So by considering a particular model and see basically a special case of what can go wrong, you can know also how to fix it. Um, so yes, this, uh, these causality conditions are more complicated than, than simply microcausality. Um, perhaps the intuition that microcausality is uh, sufficient for arbitrary configurations of uh, interactions comes also from the um, uh, cluster decomposition uh, in scattering theory, but in these types of uh, situations, it, it's, just, it's not enough. So they go beyond microcausality, that's basically a kinematical uh, condition. Uh, these conditions are dynamical in nature, they depend on how the dynamics is modeled. And this is also a nice paper that emphasizes that um, the, the correct causality conditions in QFT are in essence dynamical because the degrees of freedom themselves, the, the, the kinematical degrees of freedom, are dynamical. Uh, yeah, just uh, and something that I didn't say, but I'm just gonna claim this. Uh, this causa uh, something that I find uh, puzzling actually is that these causality conditions are also global in nature. So they, they uh, depend on the overall config configuration, uh, on the overall setup. Uh, they're usually they're hard to motivate from the local perspective of what I'm supposed to be doing over a local region, no matter who else is doing whatever anywhere else. Um, and this is a challenge for interpreting the formalism, basically. Um, so another thing that I I mentioned in particular in the context of the Unruh de Witt type uh, models, uh, is that the causal behavior of the model is uh, well described 
in the particular case of compactly supported and causally orderable detector field interactions, in this case we can characterize the causal behavior um, on a case-by-case -case basis, both perturbatively and non-perturbatively, thanks to the causal factorization property of the dynamics. And of course, there's always more things you can say um, perturbatively. Um, and then, there, there is this question that also came, came up in the previous talk, whether this assumption of compactly supported detector field interactions in space and time is an idealization that we can uh, remove. And if we remove this idealization, what notions of causality would be available then? In the case of long-range interactions, or we want to consider the long time limit or the adiabatic limit. And Maybe there's some, some stuff we, we can say, well, we have said some stuff in the context of perturbation theory, but even more so uh, beyond perturbation theory, when you have, for example, strong interactions that are always on, is, are there any notions of causality that we can, um, that we can uh, come up with? Well, um, there's no answer to this. There is a partial answer to that. So I will just mention some things and then I will close. Um, okay, so for weak interactions uh, non, um, that are non-compact, either in space or uh, in time, or both, um, such as in the adiabatic limit, um, in this work here, uh, we defined some uh, signaling estimators, second order in perturbation theory. It's based on quantum metrology and can be used to quantify this sort of like crosstalk that distant detectors can have when they're not fully space-like separated, but they're mostly space-like separated. Um, this is important also for purposes of quantum communication, entanglement harvesting, and so on. Uh, similar considerations are, are taken into account in, this, uh, in these protocols. Now, one, one extra thing I would like to say is that um, beyond perturbation theory, and for interactions that are always on, so they don't vanish uh, in, in, the time, uh, in the infinite limit, um, there are solvable models that one can consider, and uh, we did so in this work with uh, Jose de Ramon and Harris Anastopoulos. Uh, so basically we adapted the, form the formalism of quantum Brownian motion, which is a formalism about how one single harmonic oscillator interacts with a quantum field. And this can give a solvable model um, that can be used to characterize uh, all the stuff that usually we do also with perturbative techniques like quantum communication, entanglement harvesting. This is a classic reference and I'm putting some more over here about these topics. Well, we didn't use it for describing causality. As I said, this is an open problem that it's interesting to, to work on. We used it to um, understand better uh, what do detectors detect because usually the particle interpretation of the detector uh, response, uh, a detector works as a particle detector, so to say, uh, this uh, relies on the weak coupling regime. Uh, this interpretation of the response as like a click uh, that the detector does when it uh, records a particle is, uh, is applicable in the weak coupling regime. We considered the solvable models to characterize, to see what the detector measures in the strong coupling regime. In the strong coupling regime, it's insensitive to the particle content of the field, and it's basically correlated with smeared field averages. And these solvable models can be used also to, see, to characterize somehow the intermediate regime. Um, and again, yes, it, it's, a, it's an open question uh, whether um, field amplitudes for example, uh, in the strong coupling regimes uh, are measured in a way that respect causality, respects causality or not. And there are indications that actually uh, not. <laughs> so yeah, but this is a, a, an open, this is work in progress. So, um, okay. I will just uh, finish with this kind of landscape of approaches. Uh, I only mentioned um, approaches that fall under this category of local generalizations of scattering uh, processes. Uh, the detector models approach, that, uh, which is also what I mostly worked on, and also the fuse reverse framework in the algebraic uh, setting. But I should mention for completeness that there, there is also another paradigm, the history based approaches. Um, I, men I mentioned these two programs here that rely basically on generalizations of the path integral uh, approach. Uh, there might be more 
that I'm not mentioning here. All of these programs are very active today and they will have a lot to learn about how they relate to each other and what more can be done. But I would say that the common goal of all these approaches is to come up with a consistent and practicable formalism for local measurement theory in QFT. And of course, um, to come up with its interpretation uh, because the formalism alone doesn't tell you how to interpret it. And on that front, I think we have a lot to learn about the foundations of quantum field theory from historians and philosophers of QFT. I learned a lot working with Doreen Fraser. And in the spirit of today's uh, workshop, I should mention that there are interesting opportunities through the visiting program of this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, maybe I didn't say it um, as I wanted to say it, but I meant that the common goal of these ongoing programs is to develop this formalism. There are many, 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 um, how, can, how, how to put it, um, there are some proposals in place that work well, uh, each of them in a different sense. I wouldn't say it's settled, if that's what you mean. Ah, so you mean kind of like the, if this is a valid goal. Um, so that, that's also kind of like, I mean, we have quantum field theory that in principle is the best known theory that has uh, uh, combined some principles of quantum theory and some principles of at least special relativity together. Um, so I think it's uh, weird that until today we don't know exactly how to describe measurement, local measurement within this context because it's otherwise very successful and that's also why I think it's important to understand why, why is it successful only for like the high energy realm of things and then when we try to kind of like describe it, to apply it in more like Yes, asymptotic regime. And uh, so I think that's also something that this type of research is uh, exploring. You're right, there's always the possibility that there's something so wrong about the way we're trying to unify these two that we just have to abandon one or the other. Or that's what these three dots are about. Like literally come up with a totally different framework that uh, goes back to the very motivation of these two theories that we're supposed to be combining. So. And then quantum gravity considerations and all of that stuff. I don't know about quantum gravity. I'm just speculating that maybe the point is the non local measurement and getting facility as an emergent sort of complete without being very precise as such as a quantum. Okay. But yeah, but just as it, it is indeed a rather conservative approach in that sense that you're like you're saying, okay, let's just take whatever we think we know, try to put it together, and when it fails then, yeah, it, we see what to do. Um, you, know this, you know these models, you are, the vector is always another system with its own inverse space and so on. But then, I guess, if quantum field theory would be like subconsistent, those things would also be made of fields in some way, right? Is there any work in that direction? Um, or, if, or if all these models that you've been considering have just like auxiliary yeah. Yeah. So the detector models that we're considering have their own degrees of freedom. Uh, with, there is this issue, especially in solvable models. How do you even separate these degrees of freedom? Because they tend to to mix very seriously throughout time, time evolution, uh, and also you cannot assume that far away in the past they were literally uh, separable, like a separable state. Things like that you cannot assume. So it's more complicated. But uh, 
if you mean if you abandon this detector model approach and you mean like more like in the spirit of uh, the probe itself is a field and so on well this is what the fv framework right. is good for right and then more if you want to go more in depth in, uh, about like how this tool can like kind of like uh, there is very interesting work by Thales over here about how you can actually try to model um, non-relativistic detector, detector, detector system with quantum field degrees of freedom and what regime you take one or the other. There is a lot of work to be done in the overlap of these two approaches, I think. Yes, start. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't know if it was presentation. <laughs> Okay, thanks for the presentation. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for staying till so late. I hope you have some energy left for my talk after the marathon of today. So, yeah, I'm going to briefly comment what is the... Okay, here. Uh, about on the results on, in two works that I did in collaboration with, with other people, mostly from Vienna and from other institutions. Uh, on uh, the two... I would say most relevant uh, effects of, or, or, of quantum field theory in carbon space, the uh, Ulrich effect and Hawking radiation, but consider it instead of uh, in the usual situation where you consider these effects as perceived by observers that, uh, or, or typically you in, with the use of quantum detectors, as is uh, quantum particle detectors, as is customary in, uh, in quantum field theory in carbon space. Uh, instead of using the standard approach, well, we will consider these uh, detectors to be in a quantum superposition of trajectories, right? Uh, and well, let's see what comes out and how these effects are perceived in, in, and, and can, be, uh, can be addressed in, in this uh, different scenario. So, okay. Uh, just uh, as a very brief comment on why this should be interesting, well, basically, um, one, can, one shall notice that in quantum field theory in carbon space, already changing the reference frame classically, typically to an accelerated reference frame, yields interesting results, the UNRA effect, right? Uh, vacuum of a quantum field as perceived by inertial observers suddenly happens to be perceived as a thermal bath by accelerated observers. So, uh, change of reference frames in general is something non-trivial when we are handling a quantum field. Uh, and on the other side, we have that there is a developing theory on quantum reference frames, mostly in, in, in non-relativistic, uh, where one is trying to understand what happens and what, how the perception of certain quantum system changes when you jump into reference frames that are quantum. So, the idea is why not try to combine all these things together and see what happens when one considers quantum field theory, but changes of reference frame that are not between classical reference frame, but between quantum reference frames. And these works are in, aligned in, in this direction, are first, say, a little bit phenomenological approach in that direction. So, briefly revising the, the what I may call the standard room effect, if you have a a quantum field, we consider a mass scalar field in Mikonsky space-time, and you prepare it in, 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 the field is in the vacuum state for, for inertia observers, Mikonsky vacuum. Then if you consider this field as, as described by accelerated observers, this is the expression of this state, vacuum state, uh, but 
in the in the basis natural to the accelerated observers or in, in Rindler modes, one finds out that this is actually a Planck, it has a Planckian spectrum with temperature proportional to the to the acceleration, right? And, and this can be seen like that as a, as a re-expression of the state, but another typical approach in quantum field theory in curved space is to consider particle detectors, for example, if we put a particle detector following this hyperbolic trajectory in Mikonsky, which is a acceler constant accelerating trajectory, and we couple it to the field, we will find that it will get excited uh, as if it was perceiving a thermal bath with temperature proportional to the acceleration. So, um, uh, but as I said, we are not going to consider just one trajectory fixed, but we are considering a particle detector. Here's a detector with different uh, energy gaps, right, internal degrees of freedom, and we are going to put it in a quantum superposition of different, um, of different uh, trajectories, right? So it's going to be not just in one fixed trajectory, but we are going to consider a quantum superposition of, for example, these three trajectories or any others. So we have states for the internal degrees of freedom, a basis for the external degrees of freedom that describes the trajectory, and we make it the detector to interact with the, with the field. I'm not going to go in depth into the details of the interaction. This is basically interaction 10 that makes the detector to interact with the field. The field, of course, evaluated in a position which is an operator itself because it will be dependent on the trajectory. And then we prepare the, the initial state of the whole thing where our detector is not excited, the field is in the vacuum state, and we prepare a quantum superposition of trajectories. Here is the quantum superposition of, of the different trajectories with different coefficients. We we run the experiment, see what happens in first order perturbation theory, and this is what happens. Forget about handling all the details. I will, I will go through what is truly important. Once we trace out the field, because we are interested on in what is the detector perceiving, um, and, and we measure the, we also measure the external degrees of freedom of, of the detector, namely the trajectory, and we just try to see what is left for the internal degrees of freedom for the energy levels and how the detector got excited, which is giving us the information of what the detector perceived about the field. We found out, well, first there's a first term which has to do with, with the detector not getting excited because we are running first order perturbation theory. And then we get these terms, which if you see, the important thing is that they are uh, diagonal in the energies and they have a Planckian spectrum. This is a standard Unruh effect, right? With, uh, with the different accelerations that we have considered, just completely incoherently mixed. So this is something to be expected, no? A standard Unruh effect should be a, a, um, a specific result of this more general approach. So if we had found just this contribution, we wouldn't have published any article because this would be trivial. But we find also this other contribution, which, in which coherences are left between different, this is non-diagonal, off-diagonal terms, uh, for the state of internal degrees of uh, internal energy levels of the detector. Uh, and this means that there are coherences left in the internal, uh, in, terna, in the internal energy levels. And they also follow us, uh, a Planckian spectrum and there are two important things. Not they appeared conditioned to some condition that I will I will comment right now, and they are weighted by this quantity that I will also comment now. So just remember, this is these are the, the relevant novel terms appearing, and they are appeared with a condition and weighted by a factor. First, the condition. When do they appear? Well, they appear between two different energy levels, if the quotient between the energy levels and two different accelerations along two different trajectories happens to coincide, right? This is, this is the condition, right? What does that mean physically? Well, it means that if you think of it of what you are trying to, to think of what happens along each trajectory that you are going to interfere later on, Basically, if the detector went through this trajectory and got excited to some certain energy level, 
and or either went through that trajectory and got excited to another energy level, if this condition holds for these two cases, it means that the, that the particle that the detector absorbed from the, from the thermal bat it is perceiving is the degenerating energy because you have to correct between one trajectory and another by the Tolman factor of this non-trivial Greenland metric. So basically this condition entails that the energy of the detected particle by the, by the detector should be degenerating in energy for at least two of the trajectories we are considering. Right? And the second aspect is that these off-diagonal terms come with a come weighted by, by this quantity, which is actually a scalar product between, uh, between the state of the fields left through a given trajectory and through another given trajectory. And this is take this shape that I'm going to explain right now. This is a comparison between two trajectories, and this would be the distance between the trajectories uh, in, the, in the Rindler wedge along the direction uh, parallel to the acceleration, and this would be the distance along the direction perpendicular to the acceleration between two given trajectories. And um, this would be the point where the trajectories coincide, right? Um, and the farther you go from here, the more distant the trajectories are in the accelerated reference frame, right? So the more distant the trajectories are, this, this weight that the, um, that the off-diagonal terms have tends to vanish which basically means that in order to have some coherences left between the different uh, energy levels, the trajectories you are considering should, should stay close to one another, right? And this is for very low, this is a, the weight for very low energies, higher energies, higher energies, and, and much higher energies, right? The, the, the size of the region where this weight is significantly it has, gets some non, almost vanishing values, becomes smaller the higher the energies. What is the physical interpretation of that that we find, that we consider? Well, basically, um, any time the detector gets excited, in the accelerated, in the initial reference frame, one can check that what it does is to emit a Mikonsky particle. But in the accelerated reference frame, what it does is to absorb a particle from the thermal bath it is perceiving, right? And it can be the case that the particle that you absorb um, along one trajectory, when you get excited to some certain energy level, and the particle, they are not fully distinguishable. This means that the footprint you are leaving, the effect you are having on the field along different trajectories and for different energy levels, is not fully distinguishable. This means you're not fully entangled with the field. This means that when you trace the field out, you are not fully decohered. So this is what is going on. It is not always the case that, uh, that you get full decoherence with the field, right? And in this sense, you have first a condition for not get fully decohered is that these two situations, they are degenerating energy, or the wise particles that you are swallowing from the field would be fully distinguishable. This is one condition. And the other conditions that the trajectories should be closer, they are somehow giving us the physical idea that the, that the particles are absorbed around the trajectories in some region. The particles, the shape of the particles that you absorb is around your trajectory, right? Uh, and if the trajectories happen to be closer, then the, the two situations, as I said, are not fully distinguishable. So somehow these previous graphs that seem to be like, these previous graphs, we may call them the shape of a Rindler particle for different energies, right? One, in, in this specific interpretation that I'm considering, right? Uh, um, this is, uh, this is a result from the UNRU case I didn't mention at the beginning, sorry. I was going to go into more detail in the case of the UNRU effect because basically uh, in the case of Hawking radiation for um, the, the procedure is basically analogous, right? Here is a, a case of the, um, of the Hawking radiation in the case of a Svashiba hole. The, the field is also a massive scalar field and so on. 
um, and and the interaction term is the same. So that's why I went into more details in the in the former case. And what we consider here is a quantum superposition of the detector being in different positions, static positions outside the black hole, right? We beam split the detector and we consider a quantum superposition of being it either here or here or there with, with different coefficients, yes, in, as in the case of, of the Unruh effect. Um, again, the procedure is analogous. I'm not gonna go into the, into the details, also because of, of time. Uh, but we can comment here in, in the first thing is that in, in a Svashi black hole one needs to, uh, to choose the vacuum and it's not, it's not so unique or not so trivial to choose yes, as in Mikonsky, the Mikonsky vacuum state because you have more choices that have, are physically meaningful. So we considered, yeah, I'm almost done. Uh, we considered two paradigmatic cases. First, the Holte Hawking vacuum state where the, where the black hole is in thermal equilibrium with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the outside, right? So you have a thermal bath of temperature given by the Hawking temperature, no emission, just a thermal equilibrium. And in this case, this is the analogous of these uh, other, uh, other um, uh, graph that I put for the Unruh effect where here we are comparing the coherences left in the case of two trajectories that are separated. This is separation in the radial direction and this is separation in angle, right? So from i to minus pi and in the radial direction, right? Uh, I, I didn't mention you get exactly the same uh, condition on that, the, that the, you have to have the degeneracy in energy in order to find coherences. And then the coherences are weighted by this quantity. Um, and yeah, this would be, again, the shape of a particle of a Hawking vacuum, of the Hawking vacuum state in these given coordinates. This is typically the tortoise coordinate around some point where you have placed uh, your detector. It's curious to see that you get quite a peak of, the, of coherence when you put a quantum superposition of trajectories, each one in the opposite side of the, of the black hole. It's just a numerical result, you get it, that's what you find. We didn't find any special reason why this should be or not be the case, but this is what comes out. Um, and the other case of vacuum that we considered, uh, there, are, there are much more results, you can, you can take a look to the, uh, to the um, to the article for, for seeing much more details. We, com we have to take here into account also gray body factors and other things, but I didn't want to go into these technical details. The other, um, the other situation that we consider is the Unru vacuum state, uh, which is the vacuum state where the, part, where the black hole is emitting radiation, right? Hawking radiation, the state which is supposed to be left after a uh, stellar collapse. Um, forming a black hole. And here one can see that one finds out that the coherences are, are kept much, hi much higher when you consider comparing trajectories that one is, uh, the farther away you take the trajectories. Basically this is because here we cannot interpret anymore since we don't have a, 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 a thermal bath but rather a thermal flux. You, it can be the case that the, the perturbation you do in the field here is not as much distinguishable as the, the, the perturbation you do in the field there, there because all what matters is how you perturb the field in the asymptotic region and you can do a, a much more similar perturbation because all what matters is, is, is the flag. This, this, this uh, vacuum is, is defined actually in the, in the, in the null future in, uh, infinity, right? So, yeah, one can uh, interpret now this not just as a shape of a particle because you don't have a bath, but rather as the perturbation you do in the radiation of the, of the black hole as seen in the asymptotic region, and that's why you get this different behavior. Uh, a brief comment on further works. We are considering very similar situations for cosmological 
particle creation scenarios where you, we start also to put quantum superpositions of detectors. Uh, and we would like also to think about not only in terms of particle detectors, but another tool that is used in quantum field theory in coupled space, which is Bogolikov transformations. See if one can also generalize these in, in a similar sense. And finally, try to handle situations where you not only have quantum superpositions of observers or of trajectories of particle detectors, but also uh, quantum superpositions of metrics themselves and try to see if one can compare one thing with the, the current world that we do with, with these situations. And with this, I'm done. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it could be the case that this is like somehow like the uh, the other side of the coin of, of entanglement harvesting, right? That if, if I'm if I'm understanding what you mean, yeah, it it could be interesting to to take a look. I mean, I'm not hundred percent sure, but it seems that it makes sense that it, that, it, that one can see this as a, as another way of viewing uh, um, of interpreting uh, the possibility of entanglement harvesting between different detectors. And if this, it could be that this is just trivially like that, it's just one side of, or there could be some subtleties yeah, and could allow. That there must survive some contribution which comes from the weighting that you are giving to the superposition, I suppose, or not. Yes, 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 of course. So, so it wouldn't be, no, it wouldn't be, yeah. Okay. It could, could be related, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay. Then just uh, two last minutes before uh, we're done. Um, so before wrapping up, I want to first thank the speakers of today's afternoon. You were incredibly on time. Uh, I have never <laughs> experienced anything like that. Uh, also, thank you very much for sharing your research in such an exciting and curious way. Um, then I want to thank uh, both Stefan Ludescher and Andrea Di Biagio for stepping up on such short notice because I'm not feeling 100%, so thank you for sharing uh, instead of me, um, true friends. Uh, thank you also to Rick for taking care of the, all of the work for the broadcast, the live stream, all the technological stuff here is working thanks to him. And finally, thank you to Aikoki for sponsoring the very delicious coffee break. I hand over the microphone to Rick. 
Yeah, so just the, the final things. Uh, I also have a, a bunch of people to thank. So first, thank all the speakers, all the invited speakers. Chaslov, uh, Marcus, Marcus, Marius, that everyone, thank you so much for being here today. And thanks, anne Catherine for <laughs> actually managing to get these four people here, committing <laughs> to being here, to delivering talks in one day. I know that that's not an easy, an easy task. So did a very good job collecting the abstracts and everything. I think that definitely the Zerkiwide circuit uh, showed the research being done in Vienna in a very nice way. I really appreciate how in the first whole uh, session, we had lots of quantum foundations and lots of gravity, but without necessarily diving into quantum fields. I think that this is something that you guys here excel at doing, and I really enjoy hearing about this. So thank you so much for that. Um, I really thank you. Uh, thanks, Chaslov, for providing me with accommodation for being here throughout the week. <laughs> That's definitely very important. And uh, well, you guys might all want to join us next week. We're going to have the, the stream from Stockholm in Nordita. And uh, so feel free to join the, the YouTube broadcast. And if you're online with us until now, probably you would also like to join us next Friday. So thank you so much. And thanks you so much for watching. All right, that's it. <laughs>